We have an awesome God who has done so much for us, and we are certainly take this season to, to celebrate uh, the gift of salvation that we have been given through His Son. And so we think about, as He's given us uh, these, these gifts, and He sent His Son, He did so so that He would establish His church. And that we in the church would, would serve and honor and live for Him. And He's given us a, a resource to understand good biblical leadership. And so that's what we are continuing to study this morning. And, and today we actually are going to focus our, our study on the role of deacons. So what, what is a deacon? How do we define the, that, that particular role? Well, a deacon is usually translated in the scriptures as one who serves or ministers. It has a Greek word, which you see on the screens there, diakonio, to serve or to minister. And the word literally means through the dirt. Well, there's a position of honor, right? <laughs> want to serve as a deacon? We want you to crawl through the dirt for us. It is a role of servant. It's, it's, it's one who gets dirty. It's one who, who labors uh, for, on behalf of the, the, the people of God, on, on behalf of, uh, in, in early on, uh, on behalf of the apostles, and then upon the uh, discretion of, of those serving in, in the eldership. He talks about being an, an attendant, or one who ministers to someone else. And actually it appears about 29 times in the, in the New Testament. The role of the deacons initially was developed to take care of the needs of the congregation, and specifically those members of the congregation that weren't able to care for themselves very well. And so the, the heart of this starts from the book of Acts, chapter 6. So if you have your Bibles, you may want to turn there. We're going to be looking at this together. Acts, chapter 6. Appreciate Jerry reading that for us earlier this morning. And the deacons here were selected in, to, to basically wait on tables. Let's take a look at this account one more time in Acts 6, verses 1. We'll re be reading through verse 7 this time. At that time, while the disciples were increasing in number, a complaint arose on the part of the Hellenistic Jews against the native Hebrews because... Their widows were being overlooked in the daily serving of food. So the twelve summoned the congregation of disciples and said, It is not desirable for us to neglect the word of God in order to serve at tables. Therefore, brothers, select from among yourselves seven men of good reputation, full of the Spirit and of wisdom, whom we may put in charge of this task. But we will devote ourselves to the word. This statement found approval with the whole congregation, and they chose from them for themselves Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Spirit, and Philip, Prochorus, Nicanor, Timon, and Parmenas, and Nicholas, a proselyte from Antioch. And these they brought before the apostles, and after praying, they laid hands on them. And the word of God kept on spreading, and the number of disciples continued to increase greatly in Jerusalem, and a great many of the priests were becoming obedient to the faith. So here's the situation in, in, in the original situation here. We had the apostles that had been preaching and proclaiming the gospel, and the church was, had been established, and congregations were beginning to grow, and there was a, a bit of a difference uh, between... Uh, the widows of, of, of some of the, the followers versus the widows of another group of followers, and they weren't being attended to very well. And the congregation was saying, we need to make sure everybody is fairly and adequately taken care of. That, that's a good thing. And the apostles agreed with that, but they said it would be wrong for us to set aside the preaching of the Word of God so that we can take care of these kinds of tasks. And so at that, at that moment, it was decided that they would have those that would be selected to be servants to take care of the need. 
Well, there's history here. If you go back to Acts chapter 4, and begin with me at verse 32, it says, it says here that the congregation of those who believed were of one heart and of one soul. And not one of them claimed that anything that belonged to him was his own. But all these things were common property to them. With great power, the apostles were giving testimony to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. And abundant grace was upon them all. For there was not a needy person among them. For all those who were owners of lands or houses would sell them and bring the proceeds of the sales and lay them at the apostles' feet. And they would be distributed to each as each had need. So here's, here's the foundation of this, this whole circumstance. As the church was growing, there were, they did live in a population that had a great deal of physical need, of, of, of great poverty, and people that were coming into the kingdom, uh, they, had, they had specific needs. Those that had resources were giving the resources to the church, and basically what it was saying is they would lay those, those funds at the feet of the apostles for the apostles to take care of and distribute. Well, if you've read through the book of Acts before, you, you know that on the day that the... The day of Pentecost, when the church began, the church began with about 3,000. But as you continue to read through the book of Acts, you see that through the preaching of the apostles, and the Lord added to their number daily to those that were being saved. And then you keep reading, and you see that, and the Lord multiplied the numbers of the, of the kingdom. So at the initial part of this, when the people are taking selling things and giving their resources to the apostles to meet the needs of the rest of the congregation, it was probably a little bit easier distributing things. It would not take me very long this morning if I wanted to distribute out a piece of paper with, with my notes on it to you all. I could do it in short order because it's, there's not that many of us. But if the Lord added to our number daily those who were being saved and we saw the, the, the church increase, and we saw that the church multiplied, and at some point I need to distribute 3,000 or 4,000 copies of my notes. That would take me a bit longer. We'd, be, we'd use up the entire time of, this, of, of, of our worship to do that, right? It's just more complicated. So this is what's happening between Acts chapter 4 and the growth of the church in Acts chapter 6. That these funds are being laid at the apostles' feet, and the needs of the people are continuing. In fact, the needs are growing as a congregation grows. And everybody cares about making sure that people are taken care of. So this is why in Acts chapter 6, the apostles suggest that we, we, we appoint for ourselves godly men to take care of this function. And that is the foundation of the ministry of deacons. Taking care of those who are in need and making sure that the practical affairs of the needs of the congregation are being met so that the apostles can continue to preach the word of God. We do see that practice continuing as the church grew, even beyond the days of the apostles, to where there were evangelists and pastors and shepherds, which we call elders today, in each of the churches. So that's, that is kind of where the, this original design for, for deacons began. The poor community were being given food. An interesting thing is, we, as we start to look at you know qualifications and categories of people, when you get into the, to the book of uh, of First and Second Timothy, and we're, we we kind of see these qualification lists, there's a, there's a list of qualifications for those that would be placed on on women that were considered to be widows. That's these women that are getting these resources. You know, when you when you have these these widows, how do you take? Which ones are you going to take care of? And in, when, if you were to read in, the, in, the, in First and Second Timothy, it talks about there that these women that are put on this list, first of all, they have to be older than 60 years of age. Because if they're younger than 60 years of age, they're going to have an interest in men still, and they ought to go ahead and remarry. If they don't fulfill their time with a man, it says that they, these are Bible words, not mine. It says they'll become busybodies. They don't know what to do with their time. Now I know it was a culturally different period of time. I'm just looking to see who's bending down the kids have rocks from underneath the pews. 
It was a different period of time. There's people in the congregation and in our community that have needs. We need to care about those needs. We need to, to act as God's servants to care for those needs. What God has designed for the church is that there should be men who serve in the position of elder that are doing the work of an elder, shepherding the flock, preaching and teaching, and keeping themselves busy about equipping the church to be functional and ready for the kingdom of God when it comes, when he comes. And the deacon should free them to do that by doing whatever else needs to happen with just an attitude of service. An attitude of whatever the Lord needs us to do, that we, that's what we want to do. So the role, of the, the role of deacons today in the church is that they're essentially the same as, as they were in the times past. Pastors and elders are to preach the word, they're to reprove, rebuke, rebuke, I'm sorry, and exhort. And the deacons then are to be appointed to take care of everything else that needs to happen as far as the practice and function of administration and organization and taking care of the, the benevolence needs within the congregation. So what qualifies a man for this task? 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 8. If you have your Bibles, go ahead and turn there with me. 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 8. The listing of the qualifications of, of elders has just completed, been completed in verse 7, and then it goes on and says, Deacons likewise must be men of dignity and not double tongue or addicted to much wine. They're not to be fond of sordid gain, but holding to the mystery of the faith, which is a clear conscience. These men, men that must be first tested and then let them serve as deacons if they are beyond reproach. Women, specifically a reference really to their wives, likewise are to be dignified, not malicious gossips, but temperate, faithful in all things. Deacons must be husbands of one wife and of a good manager of their children and of their household. For those who have served as well as deacons obtain for them Sells a high standing. So if we go back just a couple of go back a couple of slides actually, if we could for just a moment. I want to go through this list. One more. There we go. So here's these are the things that, that are that are found in, in the scriptures that we just read through. A man of dignity, a man of, of reputation, a man that is that stands out in the congregation is one who loves the Lord, is what that is really saying. When we think of selecting those original um, seven men. They were men who were chosen because of their dignity in the congregation. They were men who were chosen because they stood out as godly men. So the life and the doctrine of the man is first of all paramount in when we, when we choose a man that would serve in the kingdom. They should be a man that holds to the mystery of the faith with a clear conscience. Well, what is the mystery of the faith? The mystery of the faith is the gospel message that was presented in, in, in the mind of God before the creation of the world, and it was designed that Jesus Christ would come and pay the penalty for sins. Not just for the Jewish nation, but for the Gentiles as well, that we would become one family, one church, one body through Jesus Christ. These men must first be tested. In other words, we don't have somebody walk in the door, you know, this week and, and, and three weeks from now we, we, we present them to be a deacon. We want to be able to know them and understand them and, and they're tested by the way that we've seen them live their lives. That their lives outside the church match their lives inside the church. And when they've been tested, when it's been recognized that they are the man that they, they appear to be, then we allow them or, or put them into the position of serving. And they should serve above reproach. Things that a deacon must not be. Next, there we go. Double tongued. This is something that is a challenge really for all Christians. And all of these qualifications would extend to each and every one of us. But this is, this is saying that, that the man that is serving in the church 
should not be one who is double-tongued, one who says one thing and does another. That their yes is their yes, their no is their no. That they're trustworthy, they're dependable. The words that they say are true and honorable. That there's, there's not a concern that, that if you entrust you something to them and, and ask them to do something, that it's going to turn out differently. And lastly, that they would not be fond of sordid gain. Take that piece right there and put it into context with what the original deacons were doing. If the whole congregation was making collections of money, and it might have been substantial at times, if people were literally selling their homes and taking the proceeds and giving it to the apostles, right? If they're taking all that money, and at one time they were giving it to the apostle, but now they're laying it at the feet of the deacons to distribute. Don't you want men that are going to manage that money honorably and well? Especially when you think in terms of, of those days that tax collectors, you know, they, they weren't just collecting the, the tax, they were collecting more to put it in their pocket and get rich on it. You wouldn't want a deacon to be fond of sordid gain, in other words, that they're going to misuse the funds of God. Maybe you're familiar with the story in the book of Acts with the family that came and, and said they sold their property and that they were giving all the proceeds to the Lord. But they didn't, they held some back, right? And that wasn't the problem. The problem was that they lied about it to the apostles, saying that they gave everything. What happened to the man that walked in and laid those funds at the feet of the apostles and said, here's all the money? They carried his dead bones out. And then his wife came in. You know, your husband was just here a moment ago. At that moment, when, he, when, when, when she's made aware that the husband was just there, you think she'd pause and scratch her head and wonder hmm, where he is. <laughs> but without thinking, she confirmed the same story. And the apostle said, and here come the feet of the men who just carried out the bones of your husband. It's not to be taken lightly how we manage the Lord's money. And so our deacons, or the, the deacons within the church that are, that are taking care of the practical things and doing the ministry and taking care of benevolence, it has to be an honorable integrity-oriented activity, that there's a service to the Lord. First of all, there's got to be a recognition that our God does see everything we do, right? It's not like we're hiding things from Him. So these are the things the deacon must not be. As you, as you go on here, then you, you see that also the deacon's family must be of a certain nature. He must be the husband of one wife. Their wives are to be dignified women, not malicious gossips, not to... Not, uh, Telling stories behind people's back. Um, they're to be temperate, even tempered, if you will, faithful in all things, and they must be good managers of their children and of their own households. Very different from what is said here versus what is said to the elders is it does not say, it does not put in the orientation that they have to be good managers because otherwise they're not able to manage the church. Why wouldn't it be in both of the lists? Well, because the elders manage and shepherd the church and lead the church. But the deacons are here to serve. They don't have that position of managing the church in the same way as the deacons do. And then their reward. The reward of, those, of the deacons for those that serve is they have a high standing. They have a, they have a reputation that builds with both God and man. And they have a growing development of great confidence in the faith that they have in Jesus Christ. If we could have the next slide, please. So the role of deacons, what is it today? What do they do today? They do whatever is necessary so the church can function effectively and the elders can be free to preach and to teach and to shepherd the congregation. When God gave the leadership in the church, he said he did so so that, the, that they could equip the church for every good work of service. That's the role of the, that's the, role of the elders and in, in, in the, in the shepherds. In that list in Ephesians chapter 4, verses 11 through 13, there's no listing <coughs> on this position of deacon. The deacons are, are, are here to, to serve the congregation so that the elders can be about equipping and nurturing and developing. So in our church, I don't you know, how, how does that translate? What do we do? What, what role should our deacons be involved in? Um, 
I've, I've been speaking with, with our elders and we're starting to explore and study and try to identify really what are those ministries, what are those things where, where they need the deacons to engage so that they can be more focused on doing the things of preaching and teaching and, and shepherding. So as, as we study these things out, I, I mean, I really do expect that we're going to see uh, much more of our, of our elders um, doing those kinds of things that you see defined in the scripture as part of their role, and that their freedom to do that will come as we have men to take care of so many of these other functions. So under consideration, and, and things that we will share with you more as the year progresses, is four areas of ministry. And they are, for the first one, is, is, is outreach. The church reaching out to the community. I'm going to just pause for one quick moment. Jackie and I are not on the same page. I'll tell you what happened. Before Sunday school, I ran home to go get something so I could give it to somebody. And I laid my sermon down and I picked up the wrong note. They're the same notes, they're just in different order. So this is not her fault. It's my fault. I just picked up the wrong notes. I, 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 I reorganized at the end of my week. So we're going to talk about the, these ministries that, that, are, that our, our leaders should be involved in. The first one is outreach. We need, the primary duty of the church is to do the work of making disciples, of getting, making sure that people know who Jesus is. So the church reaching out to those outside the church. These things in our church would include things such as missions, evangelism, Building a sense of community with, 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 our, with, with our, our town here. You know, I'm one of the newest residents in the city of Caledonia. And I, and I shared last night, I really felt it to be an honor and a privilege that they asked me to make some comments before the tree lighting ceremony. You would have been amazed at the hundreds, almost thousands of people that had come and gathered there to share in the event. It was amazing and astounding. It was our congregation. <laughs> Actually, it was our choir. It was a handful of us. But there were just a few who were present in the city and some people that joined us to sing. And out of that, a seed was planted, and we'll have to see if it still grows. But one person said, I'm going to be there on your Christmas Eve service. And I don't do those things normally. You know, we, we want to be a community. We want to be reaching out. To, if any of us would have stood there and said something came out of this, we would have been baffled by it. But we ought not be, because we serve an amazing and an awesome God. So one of the things that, that we need to do is have ministries that reach out to our community, ministries that are engaging and teaching about evangelism in, in our missions programs. Another part of the things that we really need to do here and do very well is we need to do inreach. Inreach are the things that we do within the church to reach those that are inside the church. Inreach are those things that we do that are like fellowship, encouragement, and accountability. These small groups types of ministries, it would be the fellowships that we have. You know, coming up on, on the December 31st, we're going to have our New Year's Eve event. Those are awesome times for fellowship. We need those good times. So inreach are those things that we do to strengthen ourselves so that we're better equipped for outreach. Another thing that we have to do really, really well is what I'm calling downreach. Downreach is where God is reaching down to us by communicating with us as the church to give us His Word and His message and his blessing. In this regard, our church needs to be doing things very well in the terms of equipping the saints. That's one of the activities of our elders. Our elders are responsible to make sure each of us are being trained and equipped to be godly men and women so that we can be engaged in works of service, in fellowship, in reach, or in outreach. The next one is upreach. Upreach is where the church is reaching out to communicate to God as a gift to Him. Upreach is where we're reaching out to God. It's our worship. 
It's our prayer lives. It's about our giving. It's about, you know, God seeing our heart and making, you know, my mindset of worship is that when we come together and we sing and we pray together, we come around the Lord's table, that we're giving God goosebumps. You know, we're just, that we're here to bless God in our presence and in the things that we say and the things that we share. In addition to those four ministries, there, there would be another that would be a necessary thing that we need to do, and that would be administration and facilities ministries. You know, we've got to take, be good stewards of what God has blessed us with here. And so we take care of that as well. So, you know, I see that's, that's where I see the role of our deacons uh, kind of spanning out. Uh, men that are equipped, that God has given them special, a special burden of ministry, a special talent and ability, where they can help us in outreach, or they can help us in, in inreach by being teachers. They can help us, you know, in, in, in fellowship. They can help us in caring for the properties here. Special gifts, men taking care of those things. But again, so that as a team, as a church, as a congregation, and as a family, we're all doing those things that God has called us to do. All right. So here's the big question. What about women? Are women allowed to serve in the church? In the Greek language, the word servant could have a masculine ending or a feminine ending. If you were speaking of a man who was serving, it would have a masculine ending. If you were to have a feminine ending, then you were speaking of a woman who was serving. There are biblical precedents for women who served in the church at various times and did things for Christ. Phoebe, she was a servant in the church at Centuria. You can find her in you can find her in uh, Romans chapter 6, where a greeting is sent out to her. 16, no, I'm sorry. Um, our women's ministry, our big part of our women's ministry is named after a woman in the Bible, uh, Dorcas, or sometimes called Tabitha. What was she known for? She was known for doing good deeds, taking care of other people. She wasn't known for sitting on the, on the board of the church. She didn't do that. You know why they didn't have a board? At the, they didn't have a church board. The deacons likewise. They had selected specific deacons to do specific roles. But any man that serves is considered to be, would, would, would be able to have that name deacon. Any woman that serves would be able to have that name deaconess. But as we, you know, we talked before about the apostles. There, the word apostle means messenger. If you were one of the 12 apostles, you know, the apostles, there was a capital A there. If the little a was in front of apostle, then you were just known as being one that was being sent out as a messenger. The word Christ. There's a capital C, Christ, which references Jesus the Christ. And the word Christ literally means anointed. But the truth is, everyone in this, in this room that has been, received the gift of the Holy Spirit, the indwelling gift of the Holy Spirit, you've been anointed by having that gift. I promise you, it's a small C. You have not become the Christ. You are, but you are Christed. You are anointed. The same word thing with the word deacon or deaconess. It's almost always a small d servant. It's someone who has a humble heart, a willing heart, the ability to just do because things need to get done. It wasn't about roles and titles. It wasn't about power and authority. It wasn't about creating a, a, another layer in the church board. You know, church boards through the years and over the course of time has just blown out of proportion. Our society, the, the state of Ohio and most of the states in the United States, require that a church to be a nonprofit 5013C organization has to have trustees. It's been that way for a long time. Now suddenly churches have elders, deacons, and board of trustees. The trustees are a legal representation of the church. That's all they are for the state. There's, you will not find trustees in the Word. So, understanding church leadership. 
Elders are here to equip us to become men and women of God who can stand strong when temptation comes, when false doctrine is presented, they will defend, and they will lead us. They will show us the way by going the path before us. They're not going to drive us down it like we're a bunch of cattle. They're going to lead us by doing it in front of us so we can follow their behavior. Deacons are, are people who have a, just a generous heart that love God more than anything, and they tell him, I'll do whatever you need me to do. And so they serve on the bequest of our elders, on the bequest of the congregation, to do what? Well, to engage in the things that we just talked about. Reaching out to our community, reaching into the congregation, helping us to, you know, there are, or I'm sorry, deacons that were qualified to teach. I would invite you this week to take a look at, you know, what Philip and Stephen did, uh, men that were chosen of the original seven. They, they were able to teach, but it's not a requirement. So when we speak about women, they are not a second-class citizen in the church. But where the confusion comes is where we're vying for some position of power or of, of authority, or to sit on some board and be recognized as some, some title. Why do we need someone to lead us other than our Father in heaven at the direction of his word? But we do need, we do need people to follow. We need an example, a role model, and so God has given us the elders and the deacons. But it's not about a position of power and authority. Jesus is the head of the church. Jesus loves his church. Are there decisions that need to be made? There are. But we ought to be able to trust, our elders ought to be able to trust deacons with, 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 if they have a role and responsibility to take on, say, the building, for example, that they can actually do that because they're qualified men, they're trustworthy men, they're not out for sordid gain, they're going to do the job, and the elders can be free from even thinking about it. Oh, should the elder or should the deacons maybe tell them what's going on? Absolutely. But it's not about dominance and authority, it's about coming together and serving Christ together and representing Him. So, deacons. Crawl through the mud to do whatever it takes to simply serve Jesus. It should be a description for all of us. Our hymn of decision this morning is 591. Why don't we turn to that and sing to close? Stand with me if you will. <clears throat> 